So you might recall from my email earlier, I was also going to talk about the Learning Vignette Project today. I've discovered that if I include that too, today's going to take an hour and I would kind of rather talk about the Learning Vignette Project face to face when I have everybody. So I'm going to save that for next week. Um, also, when it comes to the future of our online of our classes, I still don't have a car, but my mom says that next week she lives an hour and a half away. She says she'll drive up to here. Let me take her car and I can come to OU next Monday. So next Monday, I'm hoping we get to be face to face and then hopefully things will get worked out after that. But for today, unless you have any questions, I'm going to jump into uh, talking about the exam. Does anyone have any questions? If so, you can type them over there. While you're thinking, one of the things you might be have on your mind is, well, when is the exam and when can I take it and all of that stuff. The exam is going to open up Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. I'm going to keep it open all the way until Sunday night at 11 p.m. That gives you a very big window to figure out when is the best time for you to take it. I also, I kind of don't want to cover new information this week because Friday we're supposed to hop into our next unit, but I really don't want to do that while you're taking the exam. So we're going to hold off. No new info this week. This week we're just going to focus on the exam, kind of have it be an easier week. Um, and I am going to come up with an extra credit assignment for Friday's class because I need something for Friday's class. Um, and I usually do one more extra credit around this time. So I'll post it and it'll be something that can count for Friday's class. All right, so let's hop into it. Um, I wanted to review some of these learning theories because although students usually do well on this exam, it is a bit more complicated and we've only seen each other face to face one time for this exam and I'm kind of bummed about that. So Piaget, we first covered his main ideas and one of his biggies is constructivism, the idea that we're all curious by nature and by interacting with objects in our environment we learn. And by objects, I mean books, learning materials, even telephones and TV, just by interacting with stuff. Uh, one of his other big principles is this idea of assimilation and accommodation. They're very easily confused on the exam and quizzes. Assimilation is taking what you already know and trying to make it fit a new situation. I uh, like here seeing a dolphin and assuming it's a fish. Accommodation is true learning because you're creating new mental schemas. Like you see it and you realize that's not really a fish because it comes out of the water to breathe and learning all about dolphins and mammals that swim. Another big main idea for him is, I skipped by one, is the cycle of equilibration, which is simply going from not knowing something to knowing something. It's the terminology that can be confusing here. So you start out at disequilibrium, which is this mental discomfort because you don't understand stuff. Then you either assimilate or accommodate, and then you understand things and you have equilibration. Ta-da! And then the last of his biggies was his stage theory. And then we had two solid class periods on this. So I'm going to do a quick recap, and then we're going to do some sample questions. Sensory motor. They get object permanence, they rely heavily on their reflexes, and they begin symbolic thought, you know, understanding that baba means bottle, maybe. Pre-operational, they are not very logical in their thinking. They are egocentric, means they can't see things from other people's perspectives, and they don't really understand properties of objects. Concrete operational, remember concrete means something you can touch. So they can think about difficult stuff, but they really need something concrete like a number line or to understand fractions, they need to look at a Hershey bar or something like that. And then finally, formal operational is when they're able to do all of this, plus more. They can think hypothetically, they can problem solve, they can manipulate numbers and all of this in their head. All right, so now we're going to do some questions. I'm going to go back and forth today between providing information and giving you some sample questions. Uh, and then we're going to end. We are going to have a Kahoot for operant conditioning. 
So here's a question. Which stage is defined by illogical thinking? So since this is just in the PowerPoint, just think in your head, see if you can answer for yourself, and then I'll show you the answer. Illogical thinking is really what we're talking about with, whoops, it went too far, pre-operational stage two. Remember, that's where egocentrism and all of that is. Being unable to see things from someone else's perspective or someone else's point of view, what is that called? It is egocentrism. And I just covered that one. So remember, it looks like being selfish, but what it really is is that I don't understand that you feel differently than I do or see things differently. During which stage can students think hypothetically in their head? Well, this one might be more obvious. Formal operational, stage four. When a student is confused by something new, what is this called? It's that first step in the process of equilibration and it's disequilibrium. That is that state of mental confusion. And that's not a bad thing. According to Piaget, that's what drives you to want to learn something. If a child sees a gerbil, and maybe they've never seen a gerbil before, and they call it a mouse, what is that an example of? I know these two are easily confused. This one is assimilation. Now I accidentally changed the wording here because I thought, let me get a bit more um, rare than a gerbil and I changed it to pygmy gerboa. But again, that idea of using what I know, well, I know what a mouse is, so anything that looks like a mouse, I might call a mouse. All right, any questions on Vygotsky? You can type it over here so we can see before we go into, uh, sorry, questions on Piaget before we go into Vygotsky. I know he can be confusing, but you guys will really be at an advantage by having the online exam and having the notes in front of you. So do make sure you've got thorough notes. So for Vygotsky, I thought the best way of going over his information was going straight to the practice questions. His room, you might recall, his lesson was a bit shorter, a bit more uh, general in information. All right. <clears throat> Learning based on passing traditions from one generation to the next, what did Vygotsky call that? Now, some of those sound familiar, but this one is specifically talking about sociocultural perspective. This refers to either um, the, what you learn from growing up in a certain culture, and it also refers to what you learn from one generation to the next to the next in your family, how traditions and beliefs are passed down. Which phrase relates to social constructivism? This is an odd one, but I kind of like this question, so I stuck it in here. If you're thinking the old phrase, two heads are better than one, you're right. So Vygotsky is all about two or more people working together. That if I take what I know and combine it with what you know, wow, suddenly we both know so much more. Two heads are better than one. Whereas Piaget is more about, ooh, the things that me and my phone can do together. For something to be in your ZPD or your zone of proximal development, what must it be? You might remember ZPD is all about challenge. For it to be in your ZPD, it has to be challenging enough that you need help in order to do it. Okay, so if it's easy enough for you to do by yourself, it's not a challenge. If it's way too hard, it's not an appropriate challenge. ZPD is about an appropriate challenge. Speaking of which, what is scaffolding? Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well, in case you have forgotten, um, I erased the questions on the, on the previous one. This is the answer. Scaffolding is the help you need when you're in your ZPD. Because remember, if it's truly challenging, I need a little bit of help, and that help is called scaffolding. And lastly, what is the best example of a MKO, a more knowledgeable other?
Well, if you're thinking, well, maybe it could be all of them, it is all of them. So yes, an adult is typically an MKO, but a peer or even someone younger than you, if they know more than you do, they become a more knowledgeable other. Okay, so that's Piaget and Vygotsky. As we go along, if you have any questions, feel free to either hit unmute and just shout it out or type it in the chat because I'm going to continue to be able to see that, okay? Now, information processing, we did that one in class. Thank goodness that was one class where we got to see each other. So I feel like we went over that pretty well. The online class then went over things like forgetting and meaningful learning. So let's also examine this one using questions. And then when we get to classical and operant conditioning, I'm going to simply do some straightforward review and then at Kahoot. Okay, information processing. If I am directing my mental energy or my mental effort towards something, what am I doing? You're probably thinking, oh, it's perception or attention. It's one of those. It is attention. Remember that information processing folks, they use words a little bit differently than we do in everyday language. To them, attention is my mental effort, directing my energy towards something. Perception is not just seeing it. Perception is thinking about it and making meaning of it and trying to understand it. And thank you. I see someone wrote the answer down there. I like that. Whatever you're thinking about right now, whatever's in your head right at this moment, what memory store is that? Well, if you are thinking short-term or working memory, you're right. That is what's ever in your head right now. Sensory memory, you're not incredibly aware of. That is kind of what takes in everything from your senses. Everything I can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell right now hits my sensory memory. But what I'm actually thinking about is my short-term or working memory. And then the stuff that I think about well enough and long enough can go into that long-term memory jar. This kind of like my storage device. All right, how can you keep information in your short-term memory longer? So that's about duration. What can help me keep it in there for a longer period of time? You might be torn between rehearsal and chunking. This one is rehearsal. Close. So I'm glad you wrote chunking because that's one of the reasons why I included this question. It is real easy to get those confused. Rehearsal gives you duration or time. Chunking increases your capacity. So in fact, if you like mnemonics, I love mnemonics. They really help me. You might want to jot this one down. Capacity starts with a C. Chunking starts with a C. So every time I, um, if I'm ever torn between the two, C, chunking, capacity, that might help. What is elaboration? All right, this one is only mentioned on like two slides in memory part two. Let's see if you remember this one. Elaboration. Using what you already know to add to or to expand on something. Here's my second mnemonic for you today. And I underlined it here. Elaboration starts with an E expand on starts with an E. So when I first started teaching about memory, I would get this one confused. And once I learned this mnemonic, I've never forgotten it again. When, as soon as I see the word elaboration, I immediately think to expand on. The example you might recall from the module was um, that a student learns that whales don't have gills. That's it. I am elaborating. If I expand on that information and go, well, huh, you need gills to breathe underwater, so whales must not breathe underwater. And if they don't breathe underwater, then they're not fish and so on and so on. And I believe this is the last one for information processing, which is an example of meaningful learning. This was also from part two. So meaningful learning, 
is the idea of trying to truly understand something and connect it to things that you already know. So this would be where you're trying to create examples of something because if I just repeat it over and over, I'm just using rehearsal. If I read it and add information to my notes, well, I could just be reading and writing what I read. That doesn't mean I'm making meaning of it. So there's really not enough detail there, but that is the second best answer. Using flashcards is a good strategy. It's just not meaningful learning. That's just assessment. So this is the only one where I'm really trying to apply this new stuff to what I already know. All right. If you have any questions before we move on again, please feel free to type them over there. But classical conditioning. So I was so bummed that we didn't get to do classical or operant conditioning in the classroom because they are fun. They are my favorites. I find them interesting because especially classical conditioning is pretty wacky. Uh, it's a strange type of learning. So it is learning by connecting an involuntary response that you already have. So an automatic response, automatic means it's unlearned, it's involuntary to something new. Uh, and this can explain why we can sometimes have weird emotional or biological responses to things. And in fact, usually when you look at classical conditioning learning, it is stuff like sweaty palms, smiling, hunger, nausea, fear, laughing. Um, it can be a variety of things, but they're always involuntary biological or emotional responses. So let's go through how this happens. You start off with one of these involuntary responses, and we call this an unconditioned or unlearned stimulus response association, okay? So like babies automatically want food. I mean, that's a given. They don't have to be taught that. Every baby is born hungry and they want food. Then if you think about it, classical conditioning is kind of like hijacking, okay? So a second neutral stimulus comes along, it kind of hijacks this existing relationship. So here in this example, the, the hijacker, or the neutral stimulus is mom. Mom is the one who gives the bottle or perhaps mom is the one who's breastfeeding, okay? So when the baby's getting this thing that they automatically want, which is food, it's always connected to, perhaps it could be someone else, but in this example, it's a mom. The classical conditioning occurs when that neutral stimulus, mom, becomes a conditioned stimulus, a learned stimulus, that gets a learned response of being excited about mom. Um, so that is how it happens in all instances of classical conditioning, whether we're talking about Pavlov and the bell or whether we're talking about little Albert and the fear of the loud noises. Now, I don't have sample questions here for classical conditioning, but I do have an entire practice quiz available on Blackboard. I like to point out when you go to Blackboard to look at the exam review sheet, there are practice quizzes. You don't have to do them, but I would recommend them for every single learning theory that are questions different from this. So you have a lot of potential practice. All right, operant conditioning really comes down to reinforcement and punishment. So the reinforcement is any sort of reward I give you and all reinforcements increase your behavior, okay? So there are two types, positive and negative. And remember, they do not mean good or bad. They simply mean give or take. So positive, I'm giving you something good. It increases your behavior. Negative, I'm taking away something that you don't wanna have. It increases your behavior. Now, this is the one that is the most confusing, negative reinforcement. Even though it sounds negative, Remember, it is good. So it is me taking away a chore, taking away your headache by giving you an Advil, um, taking away a bad grade, something like that, by dropping a quiz. Uh, also remember, there are all types of different reinforcers out there. And this one here I'd like to correct is wrong. So ignore that last one on contingency, contingency contracting. I typed that in this morning and it's incorrect. So let's just move on. Punishment. 
So punishment is what you apply the consequence to decrease someone's behavior. And there are two types of punishment. Now here it does use the old terms of negative and positive. We used easier terminology, which was removal and presentation, but it's the same thing. So negative or removal punishment is if I take something from you that you, that you do want to have, but I'm punishing you by saying, I'm taking away your cell phone for the day. Positive punishment is giving you something punishing, like saying um, a scolding, yelling at you, something like that. To wrap up operant and classical, before we do our Kahoot, they have different processes. So for classical conditioning, it is always a stimulus and another stimulus leading to a response. So whether it is bell food salivate, bottle mom being excited, um, loud noise, white rat fear. So it's always two stimuli, two objects, and a resulting behavior. Operant conditioning, flip it. It's the exact opposite. So operant conditioning is I do something a response or a behavior, I do something and then I get a stimulus. So I have to behave before I get the reward or I have to misbehave before I get the punishment. And the last thing to wrap up these two is really looking at the type of behavior learned. And I already mentioned this in classical conditioning, it's involuntary. It is a feeling, it is um, biological response. Whereas with operant conditioning, it's more typical. It's like whether or not I raise my hand and wait to be called on, whether or not I mind my manners at the dinner table. Okay, we are now going to switch to Kahoot. I'm going to hit stop share. And instead, I'm going to share my whole screen. Now, this might be difficult if you don't have two devices, okay? So my share. My last class was able to figure it out. So hopefully you've got, if you've got a phone and a laptop, you can use one to be on the Zoom call and one to be on the Kahoot. Get rid of that. Get rid of this. Kahoot. Play. It will start to pull up the game pin. So go ahead and get onto Kahoot and whatever your device is that you'll be using. Now, if you don't have a second device and you're like, I'm stuck, I'm doing this on my phone and I'm nowhere near my laptop, that's okay. You can still follow along with us even if you can't punch in your, your actual answers. So here's your game pin. I love the new Halloween background. 788-0179. Awesome. Sorry, I had to check my phone. It's transmission car junkie me right now. Checking my phone. Nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, how'd you get the squid on there? That's cool. Now, when I go ahead and start to play, remember if you're still trying to log on and you're scrambling with your device, the game pin will show up at the bottom so you can still join us. All right, so let's see. I think I need to move myself way down here. Start. Now I'm going to move this up here. Negative reinforcement always causes behavior to what? Nice. I'm so glad how well you all did on this because my first class didn't do so well on this question. All kinds of reinforcement cause behavior to increase. Okay, so don't be fooled by the words negative. Fabulous. 
All right, we've got Lindsay in the lead. Deducting points from a late assignment. What is that an example of? Great job, response costs. Fabulous, because remember, just break the word down, response cost. Response is a behavior, a cost. So it's a behavior that's costing me something and it's costing me perhaps points in the class. Lindsay still at the top. Question three, giving students a piece of candy for answering a question is an example of? All right, so we were kind of across the board on that one. The answer is concrete reinforcer. Let me go through this one. So giving you a piece of candy. So I'm giving you something concrete. A concrete reinforcer is something I can touch, okay? A social reinforcer is more of an interpersonal reinforcer, like me giving you a compliment, a pat on the back, a high five. Token economy, and that was a second one that you all chose. So token economy, here's the difference. A concrete reinforcer, the thing I'm giving you is reinforcing. Okay, so I give you a sucker, that sucker is reinforcing. Token economy, I'm not giving you a direct reinforcer. I'm not handing you a piece of candy. I'm giving you maybe a chip or a fake dollar bill or a point on a board that stands for something else. And only later when you cash it in, do you get the reward. So that's the difference. And then remember response cost, that's actually a punishment, taking something away. Oh, Deacon, again, I like that squid there. Let's see what's next. Number four, removing an unpleasant chore. Okay, I'm taking something away that you don't wanna have. Fabulous, negative reinforcement. Great job. My first class had a hard time on that question, but you all did very well. Uh, the second choice uh, was removal punishment. Remember if you chose that one, if I'm removing something unpleasant, ask yourself, is that good or bad? Is that punishing? If I'm removing something you don't wanna have, that actually feels good. If I'm saying, ah, you don't have to wash the dishes or you don't have to take out the trash this week. That's a weird way of reinforcing someone. Nice, you can still at the top. Number five, which of the following is not an effective punishment? According to educational psychologists. All of these work, but they say one of them is kind of a no-no. All right, nice job, extra homework. That one was also kind of spread across the board. So I included this one on purpose because extra homework doesn't sound bad. It's just that it sends a bad message. It actually even works. It still just sends a bad message that homework is a punisher. So that's the reason why that's on the no-no list. Detention hall and in-school suspension are actually considered effective because you still have control over what the student is doing. A verbal reprimand, not the nicest thing in the world, but it is considered um, effective in terms of an appropriate punishment if you need it within the world of operant conditioning. Now, when we talk about classroom management in the future, we'll see there are a lot of better things you can do than a scolding, but we're just not there yet. Grace is ahead. All right, being removed from recess and put into timeout. What is that? Oh, doing really well on this. Fabulous, removal punishment. All right, I barely need to explain that one. So the reason it's not negative reinforcement is 
putting you into timeout feels bad. It's a punisher. A uh, negative reinforcement feels good. Nice. Grace at the top. Number seven, presentation punishment always causes behavior to do what? Nice job, decrease. All right, now, Several of you did still say increase. Remember, presentation punishment means I'm giving you a punishment like a verbal scolding, um, if it's your child, perhaps a spanking, if it's your pet, perhaps a swat on the rear. Um, so a presentation punishment means I'm giving you something that has the purpose of punishing you that should cause your behavior to decrease. Lindsay, coming on up. Number eight, operant conditioning can be described as, this one's hard, we covered this one just a minute ago. All right, so, Let's go over this one and you're not alone. The first class didn't do so great on this one either. So the most common answer was stimulus and then response. That means I give you the candy and then you do your work well. Usually doesn't work that way. Usually what has to happen is the person does the behavior, then based on whether it's good or bad, you give them the stimulus, which is the reinforcer or punisher. Now, it's funny, uh, I have this conversation with my daughter sometimes because she thinks it should be the other way around. Give me the reward and then I'll go clean my room. But we know that doesn't always work out. Deegan, all right, taking the lead. We're so close on this one to being done. Two more. Giving someone praise for good work is an example of. This fits with a pat on the back or a high five. Fabulous, positive reinforcement, giving you a reinforcer. Deegan's still up top, last question. Operant conditioning involves the learning of involuntary responses. True or false? Involuntary means something you cannot control. All right, we had, I think, the exact same response in the earlier class. So let me go over this one. And I purposefully asked some of these questions that I knew would be hard. Operant conditioning is voluntary, like whether or not I work hard or whether or not I wait and raise my hand and wait to be called on. Involuntary is classical conditioning. All right, so let's check out our podium. I want to take a picture so I can remember who my winners are. Annalise, Lindsay, number one, Spotlight, Deegan with the cool squid. <laughs> nice job, guys. All right, so I'm going to pull this down. Stop Kahoot. Now, let me go right here. So, actually, the last two slides. When you're comparing operant and classical, remember for classical, two stimuli and a stimulus is an object or an event followed by a response, which is a behavior. Operant, the behavior comes first, then you get your consequence, your reward or your punishment. And again, classical is involuntary, operant conditioning is voluntary. Now, um, I'm going to have to do these last few slides like this, and then I'll go to the chat screen and see if there's any questions. Social cognitive theory. This is a very different kind of learning where it's that idea that I watch you, I observe you, I think about what you're doing, and I decide whether or not I want to imitate you. 
we actually learn a lot of things this way. Um, one of the terms that is sometimes forgotten is vicarious learning. So I wanted to include this slide. Remember, vicarious learning is I watch you and I also look at whether or not you're reinforced or punished. If you're reinforced for what you do, I'm more likely to imitate you. We call that vicarious learning because I'm, I don't have to be reinforced. I'm seeing you get reinforced and that makes me want to do it. Uh, another big part of social cognitive theory is the, the process of modeling, the idea that one person demonstrates and then someone else observes and imitates. Any skill-based class we do this in, math, science, art, music, PE, foreign languages, so many of our subjects are taught this way. And finally, that there are some things that are really key for this to happen. First of all, your students have to pay attention. This is a theory based upon observation. They have to be able to remember it in order to you know, duplicate it. They have to be capable of doing it and then they have to actually want to do it. And those are kind of the steps on social cognitive theory. Uh, before I switch back to the Zoom page, let me put that down. If I go over here to our Blackboard page, I want to pull up the exam one. So when you click on exam two, just in case you haven't been there yet, so there's a review sheet. When you click on practice quizzes, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of them. Um, so here is this is probably the this is probably the one that we just did, the one that says exam two review. I cut and paste from some of those. Then there are specific ones embedded in Blackboard for Piaget, Vygotsky, information processing, and behaviorism. It includes both classical and operant. Now let me stop share.